May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning as a portion of the Gospel lesson read earlier, I recall your attention to the Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, beginning at the 33rd verse, where we read as follows again that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, the just one, God the Son, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating, preserving, triune God. Theme today is the church, and the church is in this parable. You see it? Church is the vineyard. So let's just go down through this parable one phrase at a time. Verse 33, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. Jesus tells these parables because it's a story that illustrates in its parts eternal truths. Teaching in parables so we would have clearer, simpler ways of understanding complex mysteries of God. The householder represents, therefore, here, who do you think? God. God is the householder, and he plants. It says here, this householder planted something. He planted a vineyard, and the vineyard is the church, the true church, the invisible church, the believers in Christ Jesus and in the Bible. God's people, the body of Christ, as we discussed last week. This is here called in the parable, the vineyard. You'll notice, how does the vineyard come to be? And whose vineyard is it? The vineyard comes to be not because of the husbandman, or because of the householder's servants. The householder himself plants the vineyard. And Jesus is here teaching us that the church is God's creation alone. God creates the believers. We don't create the believers. We don't bring ourselves to faith in Christ Jesus. And we don't bring others to faith in Christ Jesus. Only God, the Holy Ghost, does this. He plants the vineyard. It's his church, not ours. He goes on. After the householder planted the vineyard, he hedged it round about. God protects his church, as we've said before. Jesus said, all power 
is given to me in heaven and in earth. And he uses that power to protect and to build his church so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He hedges it about. He protects it. He will build it, and nothing will stop him from building it. There will be believers in Christ. His word will go forth, and though most people reject it, some will believe by the power of the Holy Ghost, and that will always exist. There will always on earth be a church, a true Christian church of believers to the glory of God. He hedged it about. And then it goes on to say, he digged a wine press in it and built a tower. Which is Jesus' way of saying about the church. He gives it everything it needs. The church will always lack for nothing it needs. God will see to it. He will provide for his church, his people, his children on earth always. It will lack for nothing. God is the one who preserves his church and cares for his church. And then he goes on in the rest of verse 33. After he provides for the vineyard and builds it and everything else, he let it out to husbandmen. Now, who are the husbandmen? These are the church leaders. These are the ones that God entrusts with his church. Gives them the responsibility for the church. These are the pastors. These are the teachers. These are the theologians. These are the officers. The overseers of God's church on earth. In the Old Testament, this included, in the Old Testament era, this included the kings of Israel. It included the priests and the Levites. And in the New Testament, we don't have kings and priests, but we have pastors and theologians and seminaries. We have synods and so forth. These are the husbandmen. They guide the church on earth. Verse 34. Well, actually, at the end of verse 33, he went into a far country. That means that these husbandmen are responsible to care for God's church. Verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near. Well, the fruit, of course, of the church is believers and eternal life for them. This is the goal of the church. This is the reason there's a church on earth. It's an incubator, it's a refuge for the believers. And as he illustrates here, they are the fruit of the vineyard. And the eternal life that they gain, all the blessings of God that they gain, that's the fruit. This is what God wants for people. And this should be what the husbandmen want, what the pastors want, what the theologians want that people have this faith, and that they grow in this faith, and that they end up in heaven. That's the fruit. And so God sends, he says in verse 34, his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits. Who are these servants that God sends? Well, uh, these are the, in the Old Testament era, the prophets, like Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and, and all those prophets. They're the ones inspired by God to write and to bring the word of God to the world. Servants of God, they're called here, that he sends. And in the New Testament era, they were the apostles who wrote the books of the New Testament that we have. So God sends these servants so that God himself shows his ownership of the church as the householder shows his ownership of the 
vineyard. It's not the husbandman's vineyard to do with as they please. The householder sends the servants to see that they're doing their job right and producing the fruit. So God has sent us the Bible. He's sent us the prophets and the apostles to run the church, to see that it produces the fruit, that the pastors and the theologians and so forth are doing their job. Are they guiding the church in the way of God? Or their own way, treating it like it was their own church, to do with as they please. But look at verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one. What is Jesus teaching us here? Here, by saying this, He's showing how most pastors, theologians, priests and Levites, whoever you want to call them, the, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the elders, the scribes, the leaders of the church, how most of them treat the Bible, the prophets and apostles. They ignore it. The leaders of God's church are given one job. Preach the word. Preach the word. God's word, don't add to it, don't detract from it, don't change it. Learn it, and then preach it strictly. Don't be men-pleasers. Don't be self-pleasers. Don't make a God of your belly, it says to the preachers, to the leaders of the church. But most of them don't do it, is what Jesus is saying here. The ones who have the responsibility to guide and lead the church are doing it wrong. They're ignoring God's word. And Jesus illustrates that with this uh, verse 35, how the husbandmen treat the householder's servants. Now, Jesus doesn't mince words. If you look at these words that he uses here in the Hebrew or in the, the Greek, what Jesus is saying here is when he says they beat one, that's kind of a mild translation of the original word. What that word really means is they skinned the hide off of them and flayed them bloody. didn't treat them very nice. They treated them with hate, contempt. We think of the prophet Jeremiah. And the Bible says, the princes were wroth with Jeremiah and smote him, put him in prison. In the New Testament era, we see the same thing. We see the Pope in church history. For centuries, there was the Spanish Inquisition and other inquisitions where people who dared to question the Pope and to say, well, the Bible doesn't say that. They were tortured in cruel ways. And then we saw the Huguenots murdered in France by the Pope's people simply because they wanted to stick to the Bible. And then came the Lutherans. And they were persecuted, and uh, Martin Luther was excommunicated, and there was a price put on his head. The Pope wanted to murder him. And it goes on in verse 35, uh, they beat one and killed another. Just outright, just plain murdered him in cold blood. There was the prophet we read of in the Old Testament, Urijah. King Jehoiakim hated him, wanted to kill him. So Urijah fled to Egypt 
for, for, for refuge. And uh, the king of Israel wasn't satisfied with that. He sent others to follow him and to fetch him. It says this in the Bible, they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword. Just exactly as Jesus here presents it in the parable. In the New Testament era, we have plenty of examples of that too. Where the leaders of the, the outward visible Christian church actually murdered in cold blood people who simply wanted to get back to the Bible. John Huss, William Tyndale, you can go down the list. All they wanted to do was preach the word. And then you have, it goes on, they beat one, they killed another, and stoned another. Well, Jesus isn't exaggerating. I take the example of the prophet Zechariah. The Bible says uh, of him. I'll read it. The Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king, in the court of the house of the Lord, unquote. Atrocities committed to God's prophets, God's apostles, God's servants, as they're called here. Persecution, even within the visible church. Those who are responsible to guide the church in the way of God, persecute those who bring the word of God. Well, the bottom line is these husbandmen have come to see the vineyard as their own property, not the householders. They want it for themselves. It's their own little fiefdom. They come to see the householder as having absolutely no right to the vineyard. And that's the way it was in Jesus' day. He's speaking here to the scribes and Pharisees and the elders of the Jewish church then. And uh, they don't see themselves in this, obviously. But he's speaking about them when he talks about these husbandmen. Uh, they saw the church, the Jewish church, as their own property to run as they wanted to run it. Their own company, you might say. And they ran it as they pleased, and they saw Jesus Christ as a threat to their little fiefdom. Is it any different today? Think of the church, the visible church today. Oh, it's very visible. Lots of big fancy church buildings. Lots of big fancy goings on. Lots of pomp and circumstance and ceremonies and so forth going on in these church buildings. Lots of talk about God going on in there. just as it was in Jesus' day. But is it truly God's church? Or is it man's church that they're controlling? Is it just a pretense? Are they pretending it's God's church, pretending to honor God with these nice buildings and these nice trappings, and yet running it themselves and ignoring God's word. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Is it all the pretense? Do they pretend 
that they're preaching God's word, pretend that they have respect for the Bible, but then do not teach it and do not obey it, seeing it as their own possession, not God's. But they can teach it anything they want to teach it. Let the Bible be beaten and killed and stoned. It was said in the Old Testament by God's prophets of the church leaders in Israel in those days, and I quote, They were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, unquote. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about here in verse 35. But then we go on to verse 36. And this is really astounding in this parable. I'm sure that the uh, scribes and Pharisees and so forth who were listening to Jesus when he told this gasped when, when he said verse 36 because in verse 35, of course, they don't know that Jesus is talking about them. He's just telling a story about a vineyard. And when he puts it in those terms, they can see clearly, well, that, that, those husbands don't own that vineyard. How dare them? Treat it like it was their own and, and kill and torture the servants of the owner. And so when Jesus says in verse 36, again, he sent other servants more than the first, they're thinking, what an idiot. He should not have had any patience with those husbandmen. He should have immediately gone in there and wiped them out and put in husbandmen who would run it the way he wanted. But little did they know he was speaking about them. We see here the great patience of God. The great patience of God in verse 36. He sends more prophets. He sends more prophets. But no matter how patient God was, what happened? They did unto them likewise. What was their crime? What, 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 did, what, did, how did the, what did they deserve death for? What did they deserve this kind of treatment for, the prophets, the apostles? All they wanted to do was bring the word of God. And for this, they were murdered. No matter how patient God has been with the world and even with his church, the Bible describes it this way. They mock the messengers of God and despise his words and misuse his prophets. It goes on to say, Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And so were the prophets and apostles treated. Only because their only crime was bringing the word of God. Well, we reached the climax to this parable in verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Now, can you imagine a father 
sending his own son into a vineyard where all of his previous servants had been tortured with atrocities and murdered? This is amazing. I'm sure that the people hearing this parable the first time thought, oh, this, this is just crazy. His son's going to be killed too. These people don't reverence him. But yet still, in his mercy and patience, the householder sends his own son to these murderers. Who's the son? It's Jesus. Speaking of himself here. Speaking of himself. God the son. No worldly father would have sent his son into a situation like this. No other owner would send other servants, let alone his own son. But that's exactly what God did. What mercy. What grace. God has for lost, sinful mankind. God the Father sent his only begotten Son into the world, knowing he would be killed, knowing he would be tortured, knowing he'd be excommunicated, knowing he'd be rejected. But God sent him anyway. And God the Son obediently came came into this world, became a man, the God-man Jesus, so that he could be cast out of the city, excommunicated from the vineyard, and tortured and put to cruel death for our sins. So that the justice of God could be satisfied that all sins could be punished, but yet no man other than Jesus be punished. And all of the sin of the world fell upon God the Son. And to prove that this is true, he didn't just stay dead, but on the third day he rose from the dead, showing he had conquered death for us all. And said, because I live, ye too shall live. He brought us, in his death, eternal life. Now, is there any more God can do, Jesus is saying here? Is there any more this householder could have done? He sent all the servants. He even sent his own son. Is there any more God can do to save you? What more could he do? How much more could he love you? What does God have to do? God, Jesus is saying here of this householder, adopted every means for our salvation. Now there's some people, a lot of atheists or unbelievers, and they say, well, if God will come and in the world, if there is a judgment day, if I stand before God someday, what are you going to say to him? Uh, and they, they give some smart aleck answer like, well, you should have given us more proof. You should have done this, God. You should have done that, God. You didn't do this right, God. You didn't do that right, God. God has done everything he can for our salvation. So that no one on the day of judgment has any room for complaint. When he has given his only begotten son to die for us. God is blameless of all people who will end up damned in hell. It's not God's fault. It's their own fault. Now, 
in many cases, you could say, well, it was the church leader's fault. And that's true. And Jesus is teaching that here. They were misled in many cases. They were lied to. They had preachers and, and, and seminaries and theologians and teachers who were like these husbandmen who rejected the prophets and the apostles, did not believe the Bible, and then passed it on to their congregations and their flocks and misled them. The scribes and the Pharisees and the elders and the Sanhedrin and all the leaders of the Jews, the rabbis, they should have reverenced God's Son. As the householder says, they will reverence my Son. They should have reverenced Jesus. They should have seen Him as the Messiah, as God come to save us. And the, the, the leaders of the church in Jesus' day should, should have hung their head in shame at their ancestors' conduct to the prophets. Yeah, yeah, our, our fathers did mistreat Jeremiah, yeah. They, they did, you know, these horrible things to the prophets, yeah. That's a terrible thing, but they didn't. In fact, they had one of the, their a prophet in their own midst, John the Baptist, and how did they treat him? And how did they treat the, apostle, the, uh, the New Testament apostles who were right there in their day in their midst? They should have repented and followed Jesus and encouraged all the me members of their church, all the Jews, to do likewise. But they didn't. The leaders sold them down the river for their own selfish gain. They saw the church as their own possession to run as they saw fit. They even asked Jesus on occasions, by what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Kind of like, it's ours to do with. We didn't give you authority, Jesus. You didn't come to the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders and the high priest to get this authority. So you're invalid. It's our church. Jesus had not been authorized by them, showing that they saw the church as theirs and themselves higher than God. And it's the same today. It was the same in the Reformation with the Papist Church. They saw it as their possession. And most of today's churches are the same way. The, the, the seminaries don't teach the Word of God. They, they teach doubt of the Word of God. The pastors go out into the congregations and teach the same doubt. And they preach everything else under the sun except the Bible. Treating the church as if it was their property to run as they see fit. And so they did not reverence the householder's son. They mocked him. They beat him, they tried him, and they crucified him. And in Acts 7, the Christian Stephen, before they stoned him to death, said to them, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one. I mean, Jesus of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, unquote. May we not deny God's right to rule His church by His word.
Amen. May the peace of God, which are now passes all man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.